had some success in this effort, we see that the current process still takes too long and discourages some good candidates from coming forward. So we see this discussion draft as a good step forward to make that process better. The discussion draft would authorize the Secretary of the Interior to transfer reclamation project facilities to qualifying state, local, and tribal entities and requires the Secretary to establish criteria for determining whether facilities are eligible for title transfer. The discussion draft is a positive development in realizing our mutual goal of facilitating additional title transfers and the Department looks forward to working with the committee to refine that draft to ensure that the legislation once introduced provides an effective and efficient authority for, sec for the Secretary and allows, for the address, allows us to address the issues and concerns of stakeholders. Our written testimony recommends additional criteria for inclusion in section four of the discussion draft in order to ensure a smooth implementation. We also need to be certain that the transfers protect the financial interest of the taxpayers of the United States. Uh, and the existence of hydropower generation facilities on reclamation projects raises additional complexities that need to be addressed if the bill envisions their potential transfer. Historically, because of these complexities, reclamation has not transferred any facilities that are included, that have included power generation. Therefore, we need to explore the implications and the process for addressing these issues. The discussion draft requires the Secretary to apply a categorical exclusion process under NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, to facilitate to facilities and eligible for transfer. We'd like to continue to work with the committee to clarify and define the conditions and requirements that ought to be included in that categorical exclusion. Uh, that would be developed as a result of this provision. In addition, in my written statement, we've recommended language to ensure that title transfers do not have an adverse impact on other project beneficiaries. Reclamation strongly supports expanding the number of projects and facilities that are transferred out of federal ownership, and we believe the process for making that hap this happen is key to our success. We are most successful when the process is collaborative, open, and inclusive, so that stakeholders have an opportunity to have their views heard, have a say in the process, and a say in the outcome. I believe that we can achieve that mutual goal of enacting title transfer legislation and look forward to continuing to work with the committee in this regard. Thank you for the opportunity to present these views. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, and I appreciate your testimony. Our third witness is Mr. Tom Knudsen, who sits on the Board of Directors for the National Water Resources Association from St. Paul, Nebraska. Mr. Knudsen, you are now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Lamborn, Ranking Member Hoffman, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify before you today. My name is Tom Knudsen. I'm a director on the National Water Resource Association Board of Directors. I've served on that board for over 20 years, and I was chairman of the Irrigation Caucus for over 15 years, which represents irrigation districts within NWRA. I may be the only person here that actually went through a transfer. It took us eight years. And I spent a lot of time before this subcommittee and time with my good friend James here in regard to make sure that we did get our transfer. We were the low-hanging fruit, but yet it took eight years. As former general manager of the Loop Basin Reclamation District, Farwell and Sargent Irrigation Districts for nearly 30 years, we felt it was important to own our facilities and take care of them just like we had since 1963. We introduced our legislation in the mid-90s. Senator Bob Kerry was very influential uh, on the Democrat side in, in attempting to get our legislation passed, and he did get it passed in the year 2000. We worked with the administration, Secretary of Interior Bruce Babbitt, to make sure that all the environmental compliance needs were there. Our bill was only a page and a half, but we had an MOU that we worked with James and others on to make sure that we met all the needs that are necessary for the environmental compliance that we need to meet. Here's some real advantages to moving projects to local ownership. First of all, we manage those districts anyway for numerous years. And now we have for the past 15 years having owned them. We're saving the federal taxpayer dollars. We're not coming back here asking for money to fix our two diversion dams, Sherman Dam, a reservoir that holds 69,000 acre feet, 400 miles of laterals and canals. We're doing it on our own. And we're doing it by going to the people that really want to get things done from the standpoint of a fishway, if you will, on the Middle Loop River, 
for the Sargent Irrigation District called the Melbourne Diversion Dam. We partied, I should say we got together with, uh, pardon my expression, we got together with Nebraska Game and Parks and we, uh, uh, maybe we did, but anyways, uh, we made sure that the Game and Parks, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the environmental folks were very satisfied with what we were doing with our diversion dam rehab. And they got their fish way. What's interesting is the estimated cost prior to this by Bureau Reclamation officials were somewhere in the neighborhood of nearly $3 million. When we got done, we used our private engineers. We spent 1.2 million rehabbing that dam, plus we got a fish way out of the deal, and we had other parties pay for it. We had the Environmental Trust in Nebraska pay for it. We had Game and Parks pay for it. We had the district pay for part of it. And yet everybody's happy at the end of the day. So the bottom line, as I see it, it's like passing this piece of paper over to James, and we have the title, and now he has it. But our one page, one and a half page piece of legislation did comply with all the environmental concerns. And the environment, as I see it, is the environment that I live in. It hasn't changed in 15 years. We still, love, we still deliver that water. We still grow crops to feed America. We provide the recreation and fisheries that the people love and we participate in. And we protect the endangered species that we said we'd protect. So Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, we ask you to move this bill forward to allow others to do what we've done for the last 15 years. And you can talk to any of the people that were on my boards of directors and any of the people that are now in charge and they'll say it's a wonderful way to go. I thank you Mr. Chairman for the time and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Our fourth witness is the Honorable Gary Dore testifying on behalf of Nimi Poo protecting the environment from Craigmont, Idaho. Mr. Dore, you are now recognized for five minutes. That's the aisle. Thank you. That's maybe Oikolo. Good morning, everybody. My name is Gary Dore. I'm here today as a member of Nimi Poo Protecting the Environment, a not for profit organization whose mission is to protect all tribal treaty reserved rights within the original ceded territory and the usual and accustomed hunting, fishing, gathering, and ceremonial use areas. I am the chairman of the Nez Perce Tribe General Council, although today I'm not here to speak on behalf of the tribe. I am a member of the tribe and am, and am an heir to the treaty provisions, and as an heir, I have a voice to speak to those specific provisions which are defined as treaty reserved rights retained by the Nimipu. The Nez Perce or Nimipu today live on 770,000 acres of the original 16 million acre homeland. Treaties after the 1855, um, or treaties after the 1855 treaty reduced our reservation to 7 million acres and once more to our present day reservation but we retain the right to hunt, fish, gather, and ceremony on all our lands. Today we, con we continue to fish all the Columbia, Snake, Clearwater, and Salmon River basins. I deeply appreciate the subcommittee's interest in restoring wild salmon in the Columbia Basin. Unfortunately, the salmon that my people have depended upon since time immemorial have nearly vanished. All remaining Snake River salmon populations today are listed under the Endangered Species Act. The federal agencies charged with protecting the salmon have spent an estimated $15 billion in the Columbia Snake River Basin. But these efforts have largely failed because we have not addressed the most significant underlying cause of the tragic loss of salmon here, the federal dams and reservoirs on the Lower Snake and Columbia Rivers. Although the Nez Perce have worked tirelessly to restore salmon, these efforts cannot succeed until we address directly the impacts of these dams. I appreciate the subcommittee's interest in protecting salmon, but the bill you are considering today is not focused on the real problem. Until we summon the courage to address the very significant impacts of the dams, our salmon will not come back. 
This is not just a loss for my tribe, but everyone in the Northwest, from fishermen to people who may never see or touch a wild salmon, but believe in the iconic magic of these fish to define the spirit of an entire region. For more than two decades, biologists have told us the single biggest step we can take to bring back our salmon is to bypass the lower snake dams. That's the issue you should be focused on today. As a member of the Nips First Tribe and, treaty to, uh, to the, and heir to the Treaty of 1855, I support the current federal statute that allows for the selective killing of sea lions. We do not see any need to alter that statute or increase the number of sea lions to be removed. Doing so will only serve to further distract people from addressing the most significant cause of decline for salmon and steelhead, that being the dams. We all agree that restoring salmon is important to the ecology, economy, and culture of our region, and that it requires an approach grounded in science and law. It is important to note here that many causes of decline, harvest pressure, hatchery practices, habitat degradation are being addressed. This is true for the issue of sea lion predation too. Let me mention one other point about the bill you are considering today. Section 4, subsection F6 of the bill eliminates environmental review under the NEPA for actions taken under the bill. NEPA is one of our most important environmental laws because it re requires that we look before we leap, evaluate and disclose to the public and decision makers the effects of federal actions and consider alternatives. I ask you re to remove this section from the bill. We need to address the harms inflicted by the federal system of dams on salmon, and I would like to comment on this important topic. First, a scientific analysis by federal, state, and tribal salmon biologists in 2007 shows that 70 percent or more of the human-caused mortality for Columbia Basin salmon is a result of their passage through the system of dams and reservoirs. The pressing, this pressing issue must be addressed. Second, this year, the fish returns in the Columbia Basin were predicted to decline by roughly 25 percent compared to last year, and that was before the return started. Now this bad news prediction has gotten worse. Far fewer fish are returning than were predicted, forcing managers to close fishing. Uh, increasing the number of sea lions that can be killed will not fix this problem. Third, the scientists have told us for years that we need to have two main tools we address, we need to have, that we have two main tools to address the impacts of the dams. We can spill water over the dams during the migration season, and we can remove the four costly dams on the lower Snake River. <clears throat> I asked the subcommittee, to, um, I, take, I take you at your word uh, that you want to recover our wild salmon, so I ask you, if you are serious about achieving that goal, why not draft a bill that would lead to removal of those dams? That would show the kind of leadership we need on this issue. Chief Joseph said, I am tired of talk that comes to nothing. We need to act upon scientific research by scientists and remove the dams. Otherwise, we may find that we will have made talk that comes to nothing and the sacred salmon will pay for our lack of due diligence. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Our final witness is Mr. Dan Keppen, Executive Director of the Family Farm Alliance from Klamath Falls, Oregon. Mr. Keppen, you are now, Keppen, you are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, good morning, Chairman Lamborn, uh, Ranking Member Huffman, and uh, members of the subcommittee. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Dan Keppen. I serve as the Executive Director for the Family Farm Alliance. We represent farmers, ranchers, and other irrigated agricultural interests in 17 western states. Our members include numerous irrigation districts and water agencies. They are responsible for the operation and maintenance of most of the Bureau of Reclamation's water supply and distribution facilities. Several of our members have worked over the past two decades to transfer all or parts of reclamation projects to local operating entities. We support the Reclamation Title Transfer Act. This bill would authorize the Secretary of the Interior to facilitate some reclamation project and facility transfers to non-federal ownership. Operations and maintenance of federal water facilities are typically performed by non-federal state-based local entities such as irrigation or water districts. Transferred works are those facilities where project operation, maintenance, and replacement responsibilities are contracted to the non-federal entity. For all intents and purposes, these facilities have already been transferred to the non-federal entity but the facilities are still owned by the federal government. Many of these projects are ripe for title transfer. Regrettably, there are also many barriers that make it difficult to efficiently transfer title to these local operating entities. This is a very important issue to our membership. In late 1997, our organization launched an initiative to encourage congressional action on pending project transfer legislation. That effort was successful and ultimately led to the historic transfer to Burley Irrigation District in Idaho two years later. 
Since then, over a dozen other projects and facilities have been transferred to local interests who have paid off construction costs of the project. Title transfers can help reduce federal costs and liability. They allow for a better allocation of federal resources. Operational decisions are timelier, timelier and many times are more cost effective when made at the local level. Traditional federal funding opportunities that were once used to tackle our massive aging water infrastructure challenges and no longer exist, unfortunately. If a local district gains title to its facilities, it can take advantage of other financing opportunities and partner with local, state, federal, and or non-governmental programs to rehabilitate their facilities. And I think Mr. Knudsen provided a, a great example of that uh, in Nebraska. Uh, despite the benefits, local water agencies are many times discouraged from pursuing title transfer because the process is expensive and slow. Environmental analyses can be time consuming, even for uncomplicated projects that will continue to be operated in the same manner as they always have been. NEPA and the procedures required to address real property and cultural and historic preservation issues are often very inefficient, time consuming and expensive. And importantly, every title transfer currently requires an act of Congress to accomplish, regardless of whether the project covers 10 acres or 10,000 acres. Reclamation projects were built to grow the West. The original implied intent was that once the repayment contracts are paid off, reclamation would turn these projects over to the local districts to operate. In due time, title to the facilities would be transferred. That simple concept has morphed over the years into a process that can be expensive, uncertain, and, and very lengthy. The draft discussion bill will make the process of title transfer for some projects much more user-friendly. Still, the proof will be in what kind of transfer process the Secretary and Reclamation will recommend. Will the spirit of the bill be implemented, or will this administrative effort embed even more process and time-consuming, expensive analysis than currently is required for title transfer? We know there are irrigation districts successfully operating and maintaining transferred works in the West who are interested in acquiring title to Reclamation facilities. This bill would help facilitate those transfers. Still, we are entrusting the development of the eligibility criteria to the Bureau of Reclamation. The bill could be strengthened by requiring that Reclamation's water and power customers are consulted during this process. This legislation should help lower administrative costs, improve certainty of outcome, and shorten timelines for some local operating entities by removing the need for congressional approval for every transfer. Still, even with the passage of legislation, some title transfers will continue to be expensive and time consuming. That's because the complexities and expensive processes of meeting the requirements of federal laws like NEPA and the Endangered Species Act. Those processes must continue to be reformed and streamlined in order for additional, more complex projects to benefit from the intent of this legislation. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to present our views today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. At this point, we'll, we will begin our questions for the witnesses to allow all of our members to participate and to ensure we can hear from all of our witnesses today. Under Committee Rule 3D, members are limited to five minutes for their questions. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Hess, thank you for being here and for your testimony. The draft bill in front of us today seeks to streamline and expedite some title transfers. Under the current process, title transfers no matter how big or how little, are considered a major federal action and therefore subject to a NEPA review, even though the entity taking ownership oftentimes already operates and maintains these facilities and will continue to operate these facilities in the same way that they have been. To help expedite this review, the discussion draft directs the Secretary to apply a categorical exclusion process for these particular conveyances. Is the Bureau of Reclamation supportive of a categorical exclusion process like the one in the bill? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, the, 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 the Bureau of Reclamation does support a categorical exclusion. I think we need to be very clear or very careful about how we craft it, uh, de de create the definitions for that so that it, it can go through the process. Unfortunately, as it stands now, we don't have a categorical exclusion that would fit this category. So we will have to uh, develop one. And that's the process that would have to go through. We would have to work with CEQ and others to develop a, a, a CE. Uh, the Bureau has uh, made a couple of attempts in his historically to create a CE uh, and have not been successful working in, in getting that through CEQ. So we would want to make sure that the process is, well, the, 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 
the definitions and the checklist that we create um, um, is, is clear and, and well-defined. Okay, thank you. Now to Mr. Keppen and Mr. Knudsen, both of you mentioned your involvement in past title transfer conveyances. In each case, the title transfer took eight years to achieve. Could you please explain how the provisions in this draft bill would have improved the process and why we need this legislation? Well, I'll take a first crack at it. Um, well, the main thing that it does is, is um, for simple transfers, a process would be set up where individual legislation would have to be developed for each simple transfer. And in the past, you know, preparing for this hearing, going through our files, and I've got huge files uh, associated with this, um, many instances you I found correspondence where it took years just because of the congressional process for this stuff to even move. And so for the simple transfers, um, uh, those simple projects, this would definitely facilitate um, that whole process. Mr. Knudsen. I would agree with what he said. Uh, and I would hope that uh, if this legislation is passed, that there's follow-up to make sure that it doesn't end up being tons of years, if you will, of, of all the compliance to get it done. In our case, uh, going back to 2000, Senator Kerry and Secretary of Interior Bruce Babbitt realized that basically we were going to do the same thing that we've been doing since 1963 in the legislation passed in 2000. So we kind of capped it and said we're going to give it a couple of years to basically complete all the historical information, the uh, uh, environmental concerns as, as it pertained to endangered species, uh, every environmental component that needed to be looked at. So basically, uh, Senator Kerry and, and Secretary of Interior Bruce Babbitt said, it should take about two years. And we were fine with that. And we paid, we paid for that environmental compliance and we got the job done. And I should point out that under the discussion draft, the larger and more complicated and more controversial transfers will still be subject to the need for uh, congressional legislation and NEPA review and other things. This is just the ones that are non-controversial and simple. Now, Mr. Keppen, in your testimony, you mentioned the numerous challenges associated with addressing the na nation's aging water infrastructure. Given these challenges, why are water users interested in assuming ownership including the liability associated with these facilities? Well, I think a big part of it is, um, and I, I mentioned this in my written testimony, a lot of the funding mechanisms and opportunities that were once available are, are no longer there, especially with the Bureau and the Department of Interior. Um, and I think Tom Knudsen's testimony provides a great example of uh, what happened with their situation. They took it to the local level. They were able to use bonding authority. They were able to partner with environmental groups. Uh, access other uh, funding streams that you, you, sometimes you're restricted by when you're uh, working with the Bureau. So that's, uh, I think we got to start being creative like that with uh, the reality of, of, of limited dollars available through the Reclamation Interior Programs. And Mr. Knudsen, a quick follow-up? Yes, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. We always felt we had the liability anyway. Here's why. Any time that we needed something done from the standpoint of the, the financial interests of the district, fixing the diversion dam, uh, working on Sherman Dam. Uh, basically, the Bureau did their job and came in and did the studies. And they said it might cost 10 million, it might cost whatever it might be. I don't remember the numbers. But they said you go back to Congress and you get the money to go ahead and, and uh, repair your dam or repair your diversion dams. and by the way, you'll have to sign a contract to repay us to do that. So subsequently, I, I said to the boards of directors, we have that liability, but we can cut that liability possibly in half by being on our own and using our own engineers and, and trying to think outside of the box and get things done uh, a whole lot cheaper. Okay, thank you for your testimony, and I now recognize the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to start with Chairman Bill uh, and a little bit off subject from today's hearing, but since I've got you here, you may know that the Trump budget proposes to zero out the $65 million Pacific Salmon Conservation Fund. I just wanted to ask you, uh, 
Um, what the impacts of that kind of action would be on salmon in the Columbia Basin and on the tribes your organization represents? That would be a big, um, I think that would be a, a big impact to our tribal fishery because we um, rebuild salmon year, yearly. And if that were to happen, I, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, the four coming years that they had, the salmon would return and the numbers that we have today rebuilt. You know, the tribes have worked together along with Krifik coming in and, and, you know, doing everything they can to protect this endangered species. Right. Zeroing out, and that fund has been a, a critical resource for that work. Yes. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Doar, uh, thank you for your testimony, which I, I sort of take your testimony to suggest that um, whatever, uh, whatever minor benefit in terms of salmon survival could occur from more culling of sea lions, it's, it's sort of rearranging a, a few deck chairs on the Titanic if you're not talking about uh, the much broader impacts of the Snake River dams. Is that a fair metaphor? I think it is. Uh, uh, thank you for your question. Um, they, they only take, the sea lions only have a 5% impact upon uh, the salmon population that make it to Bonneville. But that's only the ones that make it to Bonneville. We're talking about thousands that are lost between the dams uh, from the, the warm water, from the um, disorientation going through the spills, um, those type of things. So um, the goal here, I hope, uh, that everyone shares is recovery of these salmon populations, not just uh, continuing to uh, teeter on the brink of extinction. And, and in terms of getting to that goal of recovery, do you know any credible scientific analysis that has ever suggested that killing sea lions would lead to recovery of the salmon runs? Um, no, I don't, especially in light of the fact that, like I, I mentioned, they only take 5% uh, of the actual kill. Um, so we could kill all of the sea lions uh, envisioned in this legislation and maybe even a lot more and still not be on the path to recovery unless we do some other things. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. They're a very, very mobile population, so the sea lions that are there are all new, or basically a lot of them are new. So the more you kill, the more that will come in. I, I was made aware of a, a somewhat recent study in 2012, peer-reviewed study that actually looked at large-scale culling uh, and whether it would contribute to recovery. And the conclusion from this study by uh, uh, three scientists is, is very, very skeptical that culling uh, is a meaningful tool to help get to recovery. Are you familiar with other studies that have reached similar conclusions? Um, I'm not familiar with any more studies, no. Um, let, let's talk about this alternative of breaching, bypassing, or removing one or more of these lower Snake River dams. Um, in 2016, a federal district court judge pointed out that the federal government has just stubbornly refused to seriously consider these options and that they're at some point going to have to do that in order to comply uh, with their legal responsibilities. Um, why do you think the Corps of Engineers and National Marine Fisheries Service uh, and others have been so reluctant to consider this very obvious option for jump-starting the recovery of our salmon runs. Possibly job security. Uh, <laughs> but the other thing is a, a false sense of tourism uh, because of the, the reservoirs uh, providing the boating and, and recreational activities. When in reality, the big money maker for Idaho, Washington, Oregon is the salmon and steelhead uh, fishery seasons. And so removing these dams, the cost is going to increase with, I mean, if, we can, if we can get to the historical counts where the salmon were so thick you could walk across the backs uh, as they were spawning, if we could get to that, that's the true value of taking the dams out. That's the, the, the draw, the tourism that would, would be restored. And for us also, because I don't have any salmon this year. That's how low the run is, and, we, and today, as of 6 o'clock this morning, the Nez Perce tribe closed the fisheries. So that's, that is a prime indicator that the salmon runs are, are being decimated. Thanks very much. I, I yield. I now recognize Representative Heist for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate you for uh, conducting this uh, hearing today. I believe both of these bills are excellent examples of good governance 
Uh, they reduce red tape. Uh, that helps our fellow citizens have greater local input. And I think that's a good thing. I hope these will get past the finish line. That being said, I do have a couple of questions. I'd like to begin uh, with Chairman Bill, but specifically regarding NEPA, uh, I think uh, both bills have experienced some criticism as it relates to the NEPA language. Um, and as my colleagues, of course, we all know NEPA is a very important issue to this committee. Uh, so with that being said, let me get some clarity on the bill. Um, the bill from um, uh, Ms. Herrera Butler, uh, HR 2083, do you believe it waives NEPA? No, it, it waives NEPA for the first five years. This would allow immediate action for the current conflict and allow time for NEPA analysis and documents to be developed. Okay, so it's a temporary pause then on NEPA. Okay, uh, Mr. Hess, uh, following up a little bit on, on Chairman Lambert's question, has the Bureau of Reclamation engaged with previous administrations to get a categorical exclusion for this process under NEPA? Uh, yeah, the the in about 99, I think, the Bureau approached CEQ with a proposal to, for, to create a categorical, exclu categorical exclusion, a CE, I'm going to call it a CE because it's easier to say, a categorical exclusion. Um, and the response we got back at the time was that uh, we hadn't done enough of them to have a record that would be uh, appropriate to provide a categorical exclusion. Uh, then in about 2005, in the next administration, we made another run at a CE with CEQ, and the response back at that time was, uh, you've done a bunch of them, but you don't do them often enough that it is a regular, regularly, regularly occurring event so that uh, we're not going to move forward with a CE at this time. Okay, so there has been some communication with previous administrations on a couple of occasions, but um, n not... Uh, nothing really has come forth. So. We've never gotten past the right. conversations I just described. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Kepin, let me ask you, does the draft bill's streamline process undermine or bypass environmental laws like NEPA or ESA? Uh, no, I think it pretty specifically says that the Secretary has to um, uh, respect, as they develop the criteria, they have to respect the Endangered Species Act, tribal trust obligations. I don't have the exact language, but uh, no. All right, so compliance with the current law still is in place. Right, and then there's a, the, the criteria will be developed by the Interior Department to kind of figure out which are the simple sort of transfers. And then I believe the Secretary has provided the um, authority to uh, say this can go through a NEPA process, a, a CAD-X process. And so that's kind of similar to existing laws I, as I see it. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think these uh, is it, clarification of these um, of NEPA is very much worthwhile, and I believe that the draft legislation is intended to facilitate additional transfers, uh, which alleviates any previous concerns about the issuance of categorical exclusions under NEPA. Um, and uh, frankly, I I'm encouraged. Uh, to hear that the administration supports the application of categorical exclusions in this instance. Um, all in all, I, you know, I believe this legislation seems to be a win-win uh, for everyone involved, um, both locally uh, and for the federal government. It facilitates transfers that obviously lessens federal liability while also allowing greater input on the local level, and I think that's good across the board. So. Um, I think this, again, is a, an excellent example of a good legislation, good governance, and I do look forward to this getting across <clears> the finish line. And, Mr. Chairman, with that, I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Costa for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for this uh, hearing today with the subcommittee. And I think this uh, proposed legislation has uh, potential benefits as we look towards streamlining and expediting transfers. and areas where they make sense, um, but as we all know, whether the transfer of a project is big or small or somewhere in between, one size doesn't fit all and there are different circumstances. And I'd like to ask a question both to Mr. Keppen and, and maybe to the Bureau to respond because I think this draft 
uh, in its current form is challenged. Um, as we know, in the San Joaquin Valley, where I represent, we have a number of bureau um, projects uh, that work in conjunction with water agencies in which there are joint powers authority. Um, and uh, when you have joint powers authority that hold operational and maintenance agreements uh, with reclamation facilities, whether we're talking about San Luis and Delta Mendota Water Authority or the Fryant Water Authority, uh, these joint powers authorities comprise agencies with water agency contracts but as we know, they don't hold the uh, service contracts themselves. Uh, based on my reading of the discussion of the draft, it seems that a definition of qualifying entity, qualifying entity uh, for title transfer would not allow a transfer of a reclamation facility under the legislation entities where joint powers authorities have demonstrated a record of operating and maintaining these facilities on behalf of their member agencies. So, Mr. Keppen, uh, do you think that the joint powers authorities like those that I'm familiar with in the Valley would be able to receive many of the same benefits you described, like increased efficiencies, reduced compliance costs from a transfer of ownership uh, to a joint powers authority, or do you think those benefits uh, are limited to water service contract holders only? And so, if you could please explain under the current draft of this, and I'd like the Bureau to opine if you have a thought on this. Thanks, Mr. Costa. Well, I, I'm glad the Bureau is going to weigh in on this. Uh, my, I'm not an attorney, but I would think that because uh, transfers in the past have involved irrigation districts, uh, a JPA or, or an authority like uh, San Luis Delta Mendota Water Authority or Fryant or the TC up north in the Sacramento Valley, they're all like-oriented organizations. So common sense to me suggests that they could get the same sort of benefit that an ir individual irrigation district could. but. Uh, perhaps the bill needs to be... Um, I'm not sure the legislation is clear on that. Yes, yeah, so, so I, I, I mean, perhaps that needs to be addressed with a clear uh, definition, and I think may, maybe uh, Mr. Hess has some suggestions there or some input. I'd, I'd like to hear his take, too. I, too, am not an attorney, and, and I'm not as familiar with... Well, the, neither am I. So. Okay, so we're all in the same Let's club. all in the same um, place. <laughs> And I'm also not as familiar with the activities of that JPA, uh, with those JPAs. Uh, one of the things, I'm, I'm slightly They exist this. all over the country. Right, right, understood. Um, one of the things that we found is that we, um, when you have a multi-purpose project, one of the issues that you need to face when you're thinking about title transfer is who's going to take over the responsibilities as sort of the referee between the competing demands uh, for the facilities. Well, in the Fryant agency, we had 22 eight agencies, and they being reduced right. and then they split into three groups and now they're coming back together right. but yeah and there's there, there are cases where we are pursuing title transfers of what we considered that are multi-purpose projects but they are not complicated the reason they're not complicated is because there are joint power authorities were created in order to be that governance to provide well, that governance that's what i meant by one size doesn't fit all right Right, so to me, the, the scope of the bill is something I think we need to explore a little further. I, I don't know that necessarily single purpose is the, is the exact perfect answer because there are, there are larger multi-purpose projects where they've worked through the, comp the complexities associated with having multiple beneficiaries and competing demands and they've created, they are in the process of creating these structures that will be that referee to take the place of the Bureau. And when you have a joint power authority, I mean, in many instances where I'm familiar with, I mean, these uh, member agencies where they have a JPA have worked together uh, in, in, in fairly um, constructive fashion for decades. So, I mean, they, they have their commitments to their operations and their maintenance and they meet those and they, they have monthly meetings and they have strategic plans and they do have a history of working together uh, most of the time. Uh, sometimes, of course, the individual districts have their differences as, as well. I think it's something we need to explore. To be candid, we haven't had JPAs approach us requesting, wanting to pursue title transfer before now. So I think it's something we need to explore as we, as we move forward on this legislation. Well, Mr. Chairman, my time's expired, but I think it's one of the areas in this legislation that uh, staff and, and those who are uh, proposing and supporting the potential of this legislation need to think through and, and look at carefully. Well, thank you for bringing that to everyone's attention. And I want to thank all the witnesses for their valuable testimony. Members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for witnesses. And if so, we would ask that you respond to these in writing. 
Under Committee Rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit questions to the clerk within three business days following the hearing, and the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. If there is no further business, without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. <laughs>